Hi, I'm JC Hollywood. This is This Week in the 80s for the week beginning June 4th. We begin this week in 1980 when on June the 9th, residents of Parthenia Street in Northridge, California witnessed comedian Richard Pryor running down the street on fire. At the time, it was reported that Pryor, freebasing on cocaine, had accidentally set himself on fire. But in truth, Pryor would later admit that while the cocaine part was true, the fire was no accident. Richard Pryor was a man who built a successful career turning his demons into comedy fodder, but that did nothing to help rid him of them. Instead, he self-medicated with drugs and alcohol, and his dependence on the two became so great that, by his own admission, he couldn't even stop for five minutes. In a 1986 interview with Barbara Walters, the comedian admitted that he had doused himself in 151 proof rum and set himself alight in an attempt to end the struggle. His body covered in second and third degree burns, he wasn't given much more than a 30% chance of survival, but he slowly recovered in the burn center of a Sherman Oaks hospital over a period of six weeks. Never one to pass up an opportunity for a joke, Pryor incorporated the story into his stand-up routine when he returned to the stage two years later. He said of the event, one thing I learnt is that you can run really fast when you're on fire. Still in 1980 this week saw the release of Cold Chisel's third studio album and their biggest international success, East. Featuring the hit songs Cheap Wine, My Baby and Choir Girl, the album was the first to feature songs written by each of the band members, which according to producer Mark Opitz gave variation to the record and confidence to the players. Singer Jimmy Barnes's characteristic vocal style really began taking shape with this album, with bandmate Don Walker stating that he had developed into the most incredible singer. Allegedly, that vocal improvement was, at least in part, thanks to a combination of red wine and speed. Upon its release, Rolling Stone stated that East was, quite simply, a superb album. 1984 saw the seventh studio album for Bruce Springsteen released this week, an album that would go on to have a staggering seven top ten Billboard hit singles and would go on to become one of the highest selling albums of all time. I'm talking, of course, about Born in the USA. The follow-up to his stripped-back 1982 hit album, Nebraska, Born in the USA managed to carry over some of those darker storytelling elements while setting them against the backdrop of 80s techno-pop fused with all-American rock. The cover to the album was photographed by Annie Leibovitz and prominently featured the American flag for a number of reasons, not least of which was that the album was called Born in the USA. But it did raise some concerns for Springsteen, who stated, the flag is a powerful image. And once you set that stuff loose, you don't know what's going to be done with it. Indeed, the patriotism that defines the album has often been misinterpreted and misappropriated by many, including at least two buffoons who managed to futz their way into the role of President of the United States. The album would turn Springsteen into a global superstar and increase the popularity of what would become known as Heartland Rock, shining a light on its other proponents, Tom Petty and John Cougar Mellencamp. June the 6th, 1981, saw Angus Young featured on the cover of the first issue of Kerrang! magazine, a British publication that focused on the new wave of British heavy metal. So, Angus Young, from ACDC. The magazine, initially a supplement for weekly music newspaper sounds, took its name from the sound of a guitar playing a power chord. Still published today, it is claimed that the magazine was the first to use the term thrash metal, in a February 1984 article published by journalist Malcolm Doan. Three of the biggest movies of the 80s all came out in this week, two on the same day in fact, and fun fact, they all started with the letter G. If you were a kid in 1984 and you liked being scared, but not so scared that you were actually scared, June the 8th gave you two options for a little bit of comedy with a little bit of horror mixed in. Cinematic juggernauts Columbia and Warner Brothers went head to head with their films Ghostbusters and Gremlins. Film critic Roger Ebert reviewed them both at the time and gave Ghostbusters three and a half stars, stating, 
Ghostbusters is one of those rare films where the original fragile comic vision has survived a multi-million dollar production. To Gremlins he awarded three stars and stated it's a sophisticated witty B-movie but also a meditation on the myths in our movies. It seemed audiences agreed with him with Ghostbusters taking top spot at the box office in its week of release. The third G came a year later and this time the horror and comedy was spiced up with a little bit of piratical adventure and the Steven Spielberg produced blockbuster Goonies. In his review, Ebert identified a social change that was occurring reflected in all three of these films that would in many ways define the 80s. As he says, there used to be children's movies and adult movies, but now Spielberg has found an in-between niche for young teenagers. In many ways, along with the films of John Hughes, the three Gs of June 1984 and 85 characterized the new Hollywood. Teenagers had been going to the movies for as long as there had been movies, but now they were the target demographic, and their appetite for these films was voracious. That's going to do it for this week, ladies and gentlemen. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for joining me. I'm JC Hollywood, and I'll see you back here next week for more This Week in the 80s.